Welcome to this week's iteration of the Soil and Nutrition Conference. Very um, excited and um, really looking forward to having Lindsay Raybon on this week. Um, our the next in our sort of um, suite of, of youngers. Um, we had Faith and Kieran in the last couple of weeks doing some brilliant work. Lindsay's uh, got a lot to offer from the streets of Minneapolis to uh, I don't know homesteading to permaculture design to working with um, tribal communities to the USDA. Um, really a broad suite of experience and perspective. Um, got to know her very well working on the the um, mycelia.earth project. So there we are. Uh, I'll just let you take it away, Lindsay. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, honored to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and uh, as you've seen, you know, I'm here today to talk about what we're calling mycelia mapping um, and how to uh, use mapping, ecological mapping, as a tool for reconnecting from some of our lost knowledge and ancestral ways. So I'll also be talking a bit about building land relationship. Um, and, you know, I just really think that when we start to look at this watershed scale, uh, you know, and start to think in a watershed scale, uh, we're able to organize and interact with our food shed and our medicine shed and our fiber shed and, uh, you know, strengthen place-based agriculture and regenerative land use uh, for the next seven generations. So that's the goal, design for the next seven generations. Um, so, share my screen here. All right. Yes, so drop questions in the question box. Awesome. So uh, since I'm new to uh, the BFA community, um, I was encouraged to share a bit about uh, who I am and where I came from. So uh, just to start off, um, I just wanna say I stand on the shoulders of, of many that have come before me and I offer up this talk for uh, the future generations. This presentation is a collaboration of voices. Today, I am the voice. Um, I deeply thank my children. I have two children, a son and daughter, uh, for always coming with me on my crazy adventures and to my work sites and farm sites, rain, cold, hot, wet, whatever. Um, and they just, they, they love it. Um, and so this, they're the reason that uh, for, what I, for what I do. Um, and I sincerely thank my elders and my mentors who I've had many of. And, uh, I'm very thankful for all of the knowledge and experience that I've been blessed with already in my life. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, my lineage is from Turtle Island uh, from North America uh, in the Black Hills of Pahasapa, six grandfathers, and also Europe, Germany. Um, I originally hail from Nebraska. Uh, Lakota Territory. I am Oglala Lakota and also German American. My birth father is from Pine Ridge Reservation. So I'm from the Midwest in the United States. Uh, and I was born uh, in Nebraska, raised in Nebraska. Uh, I was adopted uh, and raised by my mother, who was a social worker, and my father, who was a teacher, uh, a science teacher. Um, and I grew up with all things nature. So, uh, you know, I learned how to garden and how to fish and how to camp um, and how to, uh, you know, dream, imagine, and be uh, in nature. I learned how to care for people, care for elders, care for children, uh, and care for the earth. At a young age, I learned about prairies. Uh, you know, I was always into geology and plants, um, you know, my bed was was filled with bags of uh, underneath my bed is filled with bags of fossils, uh, you know, and uh, this uh, connection with the earth, um, you know, really manifested this what I felt was a reciprocal relationship with nature really manifested into a strong environmental justice focus for me as a young person. Um, and so throughout college, uh, I was able to travel um, and study also in Cuba and Bangladesh and other parts of the United States, um, environmental justice issues and local food systems 
and how they worked in different cultures. Um, and this really, you know, clicked, something was clicking for me, like how important and how many connections there was to, to health and well being. And at the same time, uh, I was feeling a, a pull because I was anti a lot of things. So, you know, like I was, I was anti-war, I was anti-Monsanto, uh, anti-GMO, uh, et cetera. And I was noticing that even a lot of people in the resistance with me um, were actually not that healthy themselves, personally. Um, and so uh, I went to Guatemala after graduating uh, college and farmed there for about a year and a half on a couple of permaculture farms. And I really embodied the solution that I was I was looking for, and I found you know that I could really tangibly be pro uh, pro life sheds all of these sheds that we have around us uh, actively every day doing what I wanted to do in my livelihood addressing all the things that I was anti without having to be feel uh, you know that I was constantly having to be negative. Um, so. I have this quote up here, you know, asking what is our responsibility is perhaps also to ask what is our gift and how shall we use it from ecologist Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, and, you know, I feel like when we walk our talk, uh, when we come into alignment with our vision, our choices, our actions, uh, we're becoming responsible. And it's empowering to take responsibility and to bring ourselves into alignment with authenticity and integrity. Um, and so taking responsibility for our gifts and talents is um, it's an important process. It's not a destination. Um, and how I understand my gifts um, has deepened how I work with the land and the people. So I'm really focused in, on listening to the land um, and empowering land connections with with my clients and those that I work with. So I feel I receive power from the earth and from my ancestors. And today I'm going to share with you a bit about how I do that in my work. So, uh, you know, as I, as I said, again, I'm Lindsay and this is Paula over here on the left. Uh, and so we both were co-owners of Ecological Design. Paula Westmoreland, uh, co or she founded uh, our company in 2000. And I came on in 2005, and um, I currently live in Western Wisconsin, um, in Somerset, uh, land of the uh, territory of Dakota and Anishinaabe. Um, Paula has been an amazing partner, and I'll mention some of her works uh, throughout uh, throughout this presentation. So we're a women-owned company, uh, you know, with 20 years' experience. We do designs and installations. Um, our mission is to uh, guide and outfit uh, people on their journey, regenerating land. Um, and so we primarily focus on design, mapping, and education. And we work with urban and rural uh, farmers, homeowners, homesteaders, businesses, uh, schools, campuses, community spaces, and a significant percentage of our work is with women. Um, our approach to land is rooted in indigenous wisdom, uh, scientific knowledge, and observation. Our team is trained in ecology and holistic management, permaculture, uh, regenerative agriculture. And a little bit, a little bit of the year, I do get to um, do uh, some education. So I, I've co-taught a regenerative agriculture design course um, at Mastodon Valley Farm for the last seven years. Uh, for the last five, I've co-taught an environmental sustainability uh, college undergrad course at Lily Springs Farm in Osceola, Wisconsin. Um, I serve as a grant reviewer for the USDA beginning farmer rancher development program. And I'm on the advisory council for the Savannah Institute. So, when it comes down to it, what do we really need? Uh, what practices that support life on earth do we really need? Uh, so, you know, Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, you know, comes to mind. Clean water, nutrient dense food, uh, healthy living soil, renewable energy, safety, shelter, right regenerative culture. 
um, I see this as honoring our ancestors and our, our future ancestors and uh, regenerative cultural practices invite us to align uh, our land with ourselves. So as we move forward uh, in mind and body and spirit, the land heals itself and we heal ourselves. So uh, what's the difference between food sovereignty and food security? Food security means knowing where your next meal is gonna come from. Food sovereignty is a much deeper idea um, about having the power to decide how you and your community will shape the food system. So food sovereignty, as it says here, uh, these are this is a slide from the Lexicon of Sustainability, which is great. If you don't know about it, check it out. Um, it says, you know, livelihood plus self-determination. So it's the ability for community members to control food access independently of outside food sources. Um, so land-based food, indigenous foods, nutrient-dense foods, livelihood. Um, so today I'm speaking to food sovereignty as the link um, with, with the lens that I'm speaking to today between food and maps that we're making. You know, we use maps as the communication tool. And for me, um, it starts with land relationship. Um, relationship, you know, what are we thinking about relationship? It's, uh, it can be, you know, you can have support, you can have uh, responsiveness. Um, it's the way in which we connect. Uh, it's reciprocal. There's a, a give and take, there's an open dialogue, maybe even a dance, there's deep listening. Um, and so our relationships are deepened on frequency of contact um, and through and through intimacy. Uh, there's a, a great quote from a British sculptor, uh, Adam Goldsworthy, and uh, he says, we often forget that we are nature. Um, nature is not something separate from us, right? So when we say we've lost our connection to nature, we've lost connection to ourselves. So we experience this often uh, that the natural world is something to exploit, right? Um, with, with any form of, of colonization of the land um, or even in traditional conservation, uh, you know, keep and protect. Um, both are still keeping us separate from nature or above nature. Um, and that's simply not the way that, uh, that I see it, you know, like just, just like a quick birth story, like even if we're thinking, you know, like fungi and soil and plants and animals and humans um, and, and who we are and what the earth is, you know, like we're, we're like 62% water by weight, you know, um, and we have to replenish our water budget daily or else our, our organs don't function, like we don't function. Um, and our planet's called the blue planet or the water planet um, because it's 75% water. Uh, you know, the surface is covered with water. And so also same with the crust, you know, earth has all the minerals that we've discovered so far in the, the periodic table, but um, only about eight of them make up that top 98% of the crust. And, um, you know, so, so oxygen, silicon, aluminum, uh, iron, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium. And in addition to water, um, for us, you know, and our reliance on oxygen, you know, uh, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, that's mostly us in the form of water. Uh, but we have a smattering of all the other elements. Um, and the majority of the elements that we, of the minerals that we do have, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, magnesium, iron, are the same. Like we really literally are nature. Um, so today I want you to think about, um, you know, or even write about defining what is your relationship with land? Um, who, what, when, where? Um, did you inherit land uh, that you don't know well? Um, did you grow up on this land, but you don't farm it? Uh, are, you a, are you an owner? Are you a renter? Do you have familial history to the land? Uh, do you need to make money from the land? Do you have a, a recreational relationship with the land? So think about what, how would you define your relationship? Um, and then I have consent, 
intent and gratitude. Um, so consent is permission or agreement to engage in relationship, uh, to do anything. And so uh, I literally like begin speaking to the spirit of the land, water, animals, soil, ancestors, and ask for permission for what you want to do. Um, you may not hear or feel an answer right away, uh, but this is important before taking or you know, asking before engaging um, and explain what you want to happen. So that's the intention part. Uh, so this is really you know, having forethought uh, and having an engagement is, is much different than imprinting a design on the land or just going out there and um, not interacting. Uh, and then this is a little bit of a shift, so just stick with me on this metaphor, but um, maybe you've heard of Love Languages before. Uh, it's a book by Dr. Gary Chapman. Um, it's by no means all encompassing, but it's a great start to help shift in decolonizing ourselves around our land relationship. So I like this metaphor, but the love languages allow us to kind of free ourselves from unspoken expectations. Um, you can't demand a high yielding bushel of corn from depleted soil, right? So how do we tune in? Um, your love language is often different uh, than your partner's um, and the love language that you uh, give love is often different than the, the main love language that you receive love. Um, so identify yours um, and identify how that is with the land and what, what you think the land's love language might be. Um, so Gary Chapman offers, you know, words of affirmation, words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, uh, acts of service and physical touch. So lastly, gratitude. Um, all of these could be considered subtle energies um, you know, I think gratitude is one that is just really important for us when we're working with the land and for abundance to have as part of our paradigm. Uh, a simple, just a little simple gratitude exercise to pass along um, that you can do every day is to uh, bless your water. Um, I learned a water song, the Nibi song. Um, from Doreen Day. She's uh, Anishinaabe Ojibwe um, from the Martin clan here in Minnesota. Um, and in English, it's water, we love you. Water, we thank you. Water, we respect you. Um, and just, just say that over your water. Say it in your shower. Uh, say it over your animal trough. Say it over your well house. Um, and so we've, we've asked permission uh, we, we've given gratitude, we've spoken intention, and we're giving love. Building our land relationship. Uh, I was on a panel recently for, for Earth Day, and the question was, what are we working on that keeps Mother Earth in mind and heart? And I love that question. Um, and I thought about, like, well, how does this, you know, apply to my work? What am I doing? Um, within design and mapping and education. Um, and it really came back to this, you know, regenerative culture practice um, and land transition because we are in a, a massive uh, time of, of land transition. So uh, regenerative cultural practices, you know, they support life sheds. So they're supporting those things, the, the clean water and the healthy living soil and the nutrient dense food and, um, renewable energy and all of that um, shelter. Uh, it's, it's really uh, allowing us to, you know, do that alignment. Um, and so this, it's kind of like an intuitive process that I've been doing um, innately and subconsciously for a long time. And uh, recently a, a, a geomancer dowser named uh, Dr. Patrick McManaway uh, put it into words for me of, of the process. Um, and it's this heal the hurts, identify patterns of use, and optimize. And the process is ancient, um, yet we're just, we're kind of slowly waking up to this power. 
So to build connections and strengths, you need to be rooted. Um, and many people have not been rooted in a place or, or had the privilege of, of ancestral knowledge and stories passed down for that place that they reside in right now. Um, and everything that we're doing really is place-based. So the layers of our map the layer, are the layers of the land and each layer is a story uh, within this. And so this is kind of the lens that my colleagues and I use to communicate. Um, I get to work with people on, on building their relationship with the land. Uh, many right now are reconnecting with land or moving through an ownership change or doubling down and investing more with their land. Um, and so land connection and skilling up are all part of this uh, you know, great turning, as Joanna Macy says, um, that we're in. And so uh, people can do this you know, uh, consciously or subconsciously, but we all have a role in this. So uh, you know, there's been so many incredible speakers uh, we've already heard at the Soil and Nutrition Conference. And a, a lot of this work really uh, that we're hearing about how, um, how to improve our, our work with the land and our, our nutrient density um, is, is about optimizing um, and also you know, understanding our, our patterns. Um, and wouldn't it be great if all those nodes of light and community work for, for regeneration could be more quickly connected and empowered? Um, I think that would be awesome. So I'm gonna go through just a couple examples of what we do with the Hertz um, and then identifying our patterns of use and optimizing. So there is, there, we've got land trauma, we've got tr some trauma on the land, we've got some trauma with humans, right? So uh, you know, over there on the left, uh, you see like a frack sand mine map of, of uh, Wisconsin. Um, you see, you know, we see chemicals, we see all of our, a lot of our uh, old growth uh, forests have been um, clear cut out of, of the state. Um, and so when we talk about healing the hurts and um, geobiology and right relationship, we're working towards this mutually enhancing relationship on physical, emotional, even mental levels. Um, and we have this kind of, uh, you know, sometimes we don't hear it uh, loudly, but we can sense that um, there's a problem on the land. Sometimes we can just straight up see it uh, through through plants um, as well. That you know something something happened here. Um, and sometimes we need to research it um, and find out too. You know, like what has been here. So I really encourage you to dig into the history of your land um, and talk with the elders in your area. Um, and try to find out, you know, more, get more intimate with, with your land. Um, right now, you know, we, we see a lot of trauma on the land, just general, um, you know, mining, bombing, quarrying, clear cutting, fracking, pollution spills, chemicals. Um, we also have, there's also geopathic stress, um, you know, underground water fissures um, that can be depleting energy on the site. Um, sometimes if something really severe happened, uh, there might be a decrease even in uh, the nature spirits or the energy of the land. Um, and so we want to be able to acknowledge that, um, acknowledge what that hurt is. You know, you can't have a, a good conversation with a person who has a migraine. You know, we can't work holistically uh, with people and the land if we don't first address and acknowledge the hurts. So, so healing comes first. Um, and then some of our human traumas, as we know, uh, after uh, through the process of colonization in North America uh, and, and even wars before, there's been lots of conflict on our land, uh, enslavement, uh, forced removal, uh, and more recently in the, in the last hundred years uh, through the farm crisis, we have, we have loss on the farm. Um, and so there's, you know, there's the stolen land and, um, and loss of nature connection as well. Um, and there can be residual uh, energy of human activity that's left an imprint on the land. Um, 
lots of areas that I work in were, were battlefields, uh, for example. Um, but even tragedies like bankrupt family farm um, or hardships can leave a, a residue on the land. So it's important that we move towards acknowledging um, and doing a, a healing process for that um, so we can balance and harmonize our relationship with the land and move towards uh, optimization. So as I said, a lot of people I think in the BFA are, you know, they, they actually, their work is within the optimization. Um, identifying patterns of use is, is really like the majority of my work and I'm not speaking to it a ton right here, but it's really aligning your holistic goals with, uh, with your land's uh, needs and niches. So, you know, that's a, a process of understanding how you work the land, how you want to work land, how you, um, where you go and what you do, and then also what the land is doing. Um, so Audre Lorde has that quote, the tools of the master will not dismantle the master's house. Um, and uh, Buckminster Fuller says, you can never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So I feel like what we do when we're optimizing and we're, when we're really building that relationship with the land, we're getting ourselves out of that old pattern um, and uh, not just undoing uh, colonization or whatever the trauma is on the land, but actually we're, we're building a new model, not using uh, the tools of the master. Um, so one thing that gets less talked about than others because we love, uh, we love compost teas, we love um, a lot of different ways to optimize and inoculate our plants and our seeds and our animals. But one thing that's less talked about in this agricultural area, and I've been encouraged to, to share this with, um, with the BFA community, but you know, intention to connect and, and optimize really for me is about um, ceremony, teachings, songs, uh, stories, um, dance, all for clearing, blessing, acknowledging, listening, and engaging with spirit of place. So I invite us all to begin to learn, learn a ceremony, learn a teaching, learn a story, learn the sounds um, of your place and create your own. It's, it's so much more powerful than you realize. Um, so, uh, Within those, within those optimization, you know, I think that the other subtle energies are also really important. So just to mention, you know, regenerative agriculture uh, rooted in indigenous science and wisdom, uh, earth acupuncture, uh, you know, geomagnetism, um, Schumann resonance, biodynamic preps, homeopathy. Those are all other ways um, that we can, you know, optimize. So we've been on this journey and we've learned a lot of processes and we've developed some tools that help jumpstart people to bring them further along. So now I'm gonna get into a few stories of our maps. And I want to remind us that the map is simply the tool for how to engage. It's a data point in your mind. Uh, it's a data point on the land to help connect yourself and allow the land to show you what it wants. So. Um, I consider this a tool for spiritual land management. All right, so in permaculture, we love to talk about patterns. Um, mycelia is a dendritic pattern, uh, like rivers, uh, like our, our veins, like our lungs, um, like lightning, like tree roots, you know, that's dendritic. Um, and so when we see my, you know, we, we see mycelia as a metaphor for our work and, and even a design driver. Um, and this fractal pattern in nature's biology uh, is telling us about efficiencies and how it transfers goods and information. So it's a network. Um, Paul Stamets uh, says through the genus, the genius of evolution, the earth has selected fungal networks as a governing force managing ecosystems. I believe that mycelium is the neurological network of nature. It's the Earth's natural internet. Um, it's 
you know, as my daughter understands it, the way plants talk to each other. Um, so it's, it's really an incredible thing and it's oftentimes invisible uh, underground um, and spreading. It can spread for miles even um, and distributing goods and services as needed. So uh, just to kind of establish that, um, you know, what, what is mycelium? Because it, it'll be a metaphor. Um, the actual, like, what is mycelia? You know, it's the vegetative part of the fungus. Uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, a thread like a hyphae, it'll be called a fungal hyphae is what you see here in this picture here. Um, and, you know, they're, they're really vital for all of our, for terrestrial and even aquatic ecosystems for their role in decomposition of, of plant material. Uh, but they also contribute a lot to the organic fraction of the soil. So, um, you know, I'm not going to get into all this. We have ecto uh, and endo mycorrhizal, um, but they're very, very important, um, mostly because they are this network. It's their pattern of how they are efficiently transferring nutrients. So I wanted to make sure that if I refer to that during this talk, that we're kind of all on the same page. All right, so a little bit about um, the origin story of our first map. Uh, my colleague, Paula Westmoreland, uh, started a project, had a project um, in 2009 and um, came out with this book, This Perennial Land in, in 2010. And uh, basically, you know, it's, it's called This Perennial Land, Third Crops, Blue Earth, and a Road to Restorative Agriculture. Um, and it tells the story of the Blue Earth watershed. Um, around the same time, she also came out with this plant database called Natural Capital Plant Database. And you can check it out. It's really cool. You can pull all different lists for what you're looking for. So if you're looking to remediate, if you're looking for a nitrogen fixer, if you're looking for um, a medicine or a dye, uh, you can just click those boxes and it pulls a plant list for you. So just wanted to mention that, but um, we're also uh, starting to integrate the database with our mapping work. So back to this book, this perennial land. Um, it really tells the story of the greater blue earth watershed in Minnesota and Iowa. And uh, it was a collaboration with a number of partners, including the Department of Natural Resources, uh, who did the majority of the mapping at that time, um, to see where perennials were needed and the opportunities within the watershed uh, you know, on, on this GIS map. Um, and so the project created a vision and a pathway forward to transition corn and soybean monocrops. Uh, which Paula's family farm had become um, into a diverse and healthy agro ecosystem. So uh, let's just jump into it. So here's the Blue River Basin up here and it contributes then directly to the Mississippi River and goes straight down to the dead zone. Um, and this over here that we're looking at is a ditch that was allowed to be rewild. Um, so, in the map, uh, you know, it was really important to look at wind, erosion, water bodies, and habitat. Um, and and the map layers would then show where there would be opportunities for riparian buffer projects, wildlife corridors, and uh, perennial, perennial opportunities. Um, and really working at this watershed scale was really important, uh, ended up becoming more important, they realized uh, after they were, they're already into it. Um, they didn't really realize exactly all of the good outcomes that would come from this book. So here's a couple examples of the opportunity maps, as they're called. Um, so you can see over here, uh, the red you're looking at is, is pretty steep slopes um, and the green, the ecological patches. Um, and then the hatch marks uh, really show over here is a little bit more zoomed in. 
the hatch marks really show either where there's a gap, as in the wildlife would not be able to move uh, through to get to water, to get to habitat because of the farming um, or development, um, but also, you know, an opportunity for, uh, for perennial land. Um, so this is how it was used, you know, the, the original partners for this map were, were the DNR, the NRCS, um, the Soil and Water Conservation District, SWCD, uh, great geologist, Carrie Jennings, um, University of Minnesota uh, for, for wetland restoration were also involved uh, with more on the ground validation of maps because maps always have to be ground truthed, right? Um, to help prioritize the criteria. So the main criteria, again, you know, it's wind erosion, uh, soil, uh, soil and water erosion, the water bodies themselves, and then habitat. Uh, so this is, you know, it, it, it excluded prime farmland and it really looked at the marginal lands um, and what could be moved on and is really grounded in, uh, you know, West Jackson um, and Wendell Berry's 100 uh, year farm bill. If you haven't heard of that, you should check it out. Um, so within, you know, so once they had this map, they went about and they had some community uh, sessions. This is a historical photo um, from the 1920s. You can see haystacks over here and um, that a lot of hay was, was, was made back then and, and diversified grains were rotated and, um, you know, pretty decent farming compared to what is there now. Uh, and their, their waterways were a lot healthier. And so these community vision sessions are really cool because they asked people like, what do you remember? Um, and what do you miss? And then in the next 20 to 50 years, what do you want to see in your watershed? Um, and so it's just fantastic. Turned into uh, a number of opportunities. Um, people and organizations and nonprofits, uh, ranchers, grazers um, that were working in watershed, many of them did not know about each other. Many of them did not, had no idea that they were even working on parallel or similar projects. So that was one obvious uh, win out of it, but then also it led to a number of um, priorities um, for which the river basin could be moved on. So, all right, fast forward. So that's opportunity maps from this perennial land uh, from 2010. So. Now, fast forward to 2019 or so, and at Ecological Design, you know, we're really uh, trying to hone in on how we can use the maps for larger watershed scale. So we decided to uh, look at Wisconsin um, and a county that's close to us that we have uh, a number, a handful of customers uh, clients and farmers that live here, um, farmers and land trusts that are in this county. And so it's called Polk County and it's in Western Wisconsin, right here. This is all of Wisconsin. And so here's the county. And then within the county, these are all the micro basins. So these are all watersheds and these are the smaller watersheds within the county, okay? Uh, and Polk has an amazing amount of mapping done. They have, they, have a really, uh, they have a really great GIS program in the DNR and they also have uh, Polk County Land and Water Resources. Um, and so these slides down here came from the 2019 to 2029 strategic plan um, in which they uh, you know, ranked all of the watersheds. Um, so they looked at it, I don't know if we can read it sideways, but um, the way that they ranked these watersheds is kind of important, um, but it's, it included phosphorus loading and impaired waters, um, how many partner groups uh, were around, um, the percent acres in like a water quality management plan, uh, watersheds that ends in lakes, the stream order, um, the percent of agricultural land cover, um, how many livestock facilities 
are around um, and ground, uh, groundwater contamination susceptibility, um, lake development, uh, HEL, highly erodible soils, uh, depth to bedrock, and they also outlined if they were an outstanding or exceptional water. Um, and so we were looking at this and we we're like, oh, we have a number of clients in the red. These ones, um, 121 and 124 and 126 in these micro basins, Balsam Branch, Horse Creek, right? Um, so we thought, hmm, maybe we should, you know, look a little closer. So we look at some other data here. So these we start to see are some of the layers of the map that we're looking at. So we always look at soil, we always look at water. It's the foundation of healthy food, right? Um, and if you can see here, Polk has some really great soil, um, uh, usually a silty loam in general, but we have a lot of variation. We have you know historical glaciers that came through here. And so we have a number of glacial till. Um, you can see how much prime farmland there is in this county. Um, and you know, total it's like 600,000 acres or so, just to give you an idea of how big uh, the county is. And there is a large amount of water in this county as well. There's 440 lakes, something like that. Um, 365 miles of rivers and streams and 98 miles of, of trout streams. So uh, it's, it's kind of a rolling landscape and um, it's really great for farming, but also for, for recreation. Um, and the groundwater susceptibility map is really important uh, because groundwater is the sole source of drinking water in this county. Um, so, you know, the health of the citizens is directly correlated to the quality of the groundwater. Um, and there's health standards for things like lead and arsenic, um, manganese, nitrates. Uh, so, you know, those are, those are regularly checked and you can find that data for yourself in your own county map. Um, but about 10% of Polk County wells exceed the standard for lead and about 5% exceed the standard for manganese and about 3% exceed the the standard for nitrates. Um, and about 21% of the wells uh, tested positive for coliform as well. So you can see down here kind of the land use percentages. So we're like, okay, we're getting the environmental data. Um, and then now where are the people? Uh, and so, you know, we look at this and you can see, oh, there's, there's more people, there's more development happening down here. There's less people up here. Uh, notably up here correlates in the blue where there's the least people is the most outstanding water quality. Um, and so we also wanna look at like, what, far, what is farming contributing to the landscape? So you look over here um, and you can see, uh, this is from the farm bill before. So, uh, it's 2017 data still, but uh, you can see it's about 1,200 farms or so. Um, and you can see what kind of farming too. Uh, there's, there's a good amount of, I think I might have the numbers here too, uh, about you know 66,000 acres planted in corn, 40,000 planted in forage, 37,000 acres are planted in soybeans. Um, small grains are planted in a couple thousand acres. Um, vegetables are produced on uh, about 3,500 acres. Um, Christmas trees, orchards are, are accounting for another um, about 400 acres. So we wanted to, similar to the this perennial lands map, figure out our own process um, for how we create now a, a, a current opportunity map. So this looks a little bit crazy because I clicked every single uh, layer just to show you all the data, but um, you know, we wanted to kind of see uh, what are the patterns, you know? So, so, so we're, we're looking in and we're trying to hone in on the patterns and uh, the positive trends and also the, the negative trends. And so the ecological patterns here that we were tuning into were the water bodies. Uh, and then we also pulled the impaired lakes. That's that kind of really bright blue. 
um, and the impaired rivers. Uh, and then we're looking at habitat and we're looking at how many acres are in cultivation, like which acres are cultivated or tilled. Um, and so that, that left us with this map. The, the red is, uh, is where the nitrates are exceeding um, the, red, the red dots. Okay, so we looked at the ecological layer. This is our process. And we look at the social layer. And the social layer is harder to find. Um, it's harder data to find. This is better community uh, made. Um, but we, because we're pretty familiar with this county, we're able to do it uh, fairly, fairly easy. Again, we're looking for leverage points, things that bisect in the landscape. Uh, Duilaney Triangle is another way to think about connecting dots and connecting, finding areas of focus. Um, we have a collection. So uh, for these ones, we are interested in looking at, you know, farm to table restaurants, farmers markets, uh, the farms themselves um, of who was there and, you know, farm supplies or nursery plant material. Uh, so we started to also see, you know, where, where are these people that are working with the land? And we ended up honing on this, this lake, this area, um, in the Balsam Branch Wapagasset uh, micro watershed. And so here you can see what we are overlapping is all of the opportunity areas. So that's the vulnerable areas, the areas with habitat. Um, and what we're really looking for is uh, what will be the most influential on the greater watershed if this was healed, if this was worked on. Um, so it's not like the worst problem, but it is the third top priority ranked watershed in the county. Um, so it does definitely have its issues, but it also has a really diverse amount of people, uh, including regenerative farmers, farm to table restaurants, and people that, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a farmer led uh, watershed group even. Um, so there's people that are really interested. There's a YMCA right on this lake in having, interested in having clean water and, and healthy drinking water. So. Uh, that's mostly why we chose it. So here you can look, I don't think I have another, oh, yep. So here is an impaired, it's called Friday Creek and it goes right into the lake um, and comes out here with a man-made dam and they have high phosphorus and algae um, and some other contaminations, lots of curly pondweed and other things that the Lake Association is trying to work out. And so this and it eventually flows down to the Apple River. So this is how this is our process that we've created to find opportunity areas. And so you can see here, you can you can start to think about emanating out like a spore, like a mycelia uh, from from one priority area or even from a farm you could choose. Um, and then look at uh, what we're calling is kind of the least cost pathway um, from node to all of the different opportunity areas that we're identifying that could be potential remediation, restoration, regeneration projects. And so least cost means, uh, you know, it's the line prefers to run in the most connected way possible. Um, so it's a map for animal movement, human movement, um, as well, which I think is pretty cool. All right, and so just doing that map, it's not the end, like it's just the beginning. So that's when the work actually starts. But today, um, you know, it gives us basis for organizing. Um, so another story that I want to uh, tell you, another powerful story about mapping um, in, in Minnesota, uh, we have a, a tar sands pipeline coming through uh, by a company called Embridge. Um, and line three is very, it's, it's dangerous. It's a threat to uh, a way of life, um, but particularly it's going through a, a large amount of territory, uh, treaty territory and also wild rice lands. That's what you see down here on the left. Um, and so the proposed oil pipeline route goes through like 227 lakes and rivers, including the Mississippi River. Um, and, and so it's, it's really putting a lot of people at risk. Um, and 
it is very expensive as well. So here's the pipeline path. This is in Bridges map. You can see where it goes. We're talking about this area in Minnesota right now. And then this is the wild rice uh, map um, that is made by Honor the Earth. And if you don't know wild rice, you should have it. It's amazing. Uh, it's nutrient dense, healthy, indigenous uh, food ecosystem here. Um, and you know, it's it's really in the heart of Ojibwe treaty territory. So I uh, started looking at these maps and we thought, oh, this is good. You know, stop line three, they have their own interactive map. People are starting to get on a mapping like, yes, communities should map their stuff um, to communicate. Went, this is a pretty good map. So check that out. Um, and we said, what, what's missing? All right, let's use our process. So we pulled the water, right? Water's life, water's first. Pull that water, we see the watershed. We see the reservations here um, and treaties. Um, then, we, then we think about who owns the land? Who manages the land? Um, so we also pulled, uh, you know, the green is all the state forests and the pink is all the wildlife management areas. And this, this lighter green is state parks. And uh, the, the lightest blue here is scientific and natural areas. So the pipeline strategically chooses our commons, our public lands, uh, as much as they can to put this oil line through. Okay, so who, pull the water, pull the ecosystems, pull the food, look at who owns the thing, who owns the land. Um, and then the last layer that we decided to pull was, was the archaeological layer. Um, and so this is, uh, this can be found on the, you know, the website from the state archaeologist from the uh, Minnesota State Archaeologist. And up here it says, you know, for the uh, archaeological sites that have been documented, the lightest blue is fewer than three, the medium blue is three to five sites, and this bright blue is six to 11 sites. Um, so as we zoom in, unsurprisingly, we see where archaeology ar archaeology sites are located right on the pipeline. So they'll be drilling under, but not only they're drilling under the land here, they're drilling under two main rivers uh, that we drink from. So the Mississippi River and the Willow River. There's other ones obviously too, but right smack dab where there's a documented, and oftentimes wherever one is documented means there's many more uh, sites actually there. Um, so we thought this is really wild. Like, do people know about this? They need to know about this. Um, and it's the right of uh, you know a landowner to to know the their archaeology report. It's the right of a tribal historic preservation officer to also receive this information. Um, but sometimes they don't get that information. Uh, so and in this case, it was not explicit. It was not explicitly understood um, by by that typo. So um, we were able to use these maps. Here's two of the sites. We zoomed in further. Willow River, Mississippi River, you can see. Um, and, and the organizers uh, were then able to use this map um, in some of the, in their federal court case. So as you can tell, I'm really pumped about maps. Um, and I'm pumped about mycelia. And uh, last year we started working with a collaboration of people um, who uh, really understood this concept um, and wanted to take it further. And you know, when, when we combine what we're in right now in this great time of transition, um, you know, with 400 acres of land about to change hands in the next 20 years, 400 million acres of land it's larger than the Louisiana Purchase. Um, we haven't seen this, you know, and, and who is going to manage those lands? And, and how are we going to get our, our healthy food and water? You know, it's a big question. Uh, the average age of the American farmer is 57. All these things that we know, they're like, what is that pattern adding up to? It's a pretty big pattern. And we know increasingly that we need carbon sequestration, soil health, um, regenerative techniques, you know, the, the future of young ecologically minded farmers is essential to the future of food. Um, so every day we exchange goods, services, even land 
Um, you know, we are an ecosystem. We are the mycelium. Um, so wouldn't it be great if we had that ecosystem mapped out, the life sheds of your territory? So mycelia.earth uh, started coming about uh, with strong support um, seeded from the BFA. Um, and a number of us originally, we call it Permacore, um, and started to work with some other uh, technical groups to, to bring this along with a lot of open source uh, commons principles. You see down here, some generation thinking, uh, you know, privacy, user sovereignty, inclusivity, transparency, cooperative ownership. And really, uh, people can start to map out many of their connections in their own mycelial ecosystem. And I think this is relevant for lots of work that's going on right now because uh, you know, the old farmers can't get out and then if the new farmers can't get in, right? Um, and so we see a lot of things shifting like the good work of Agrarian Commons, the good work of Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust that are able to you know, more increasingly secure lands for those who, do, who want to grow good food uh, for their community who um, you know, have this really large hurdle of land access. Um, and so the way that more of these maps can even be leveraged even more are as, you know, some programs that, you know, with those opportunity projects, like how do you want to organize on the land? Uh, one example is, you know, perennial core, uh, a throwback, right, to um, conservation core. But if we had skilled people being able to move through a land, to bring more food, to bring increased uh, water remediation uh, projects, to uh, have more pollinator projects, to have more traditional foods on the land, to heal old parts of the land. Um, wouldn't it be great to use our opportunity maps to prioritize areas where our projects could go in the watershed? So, I just want to make sure everybody knows that um, like a really easy and free way to make your own social map is just Google my maps. Um, and so you just say Google my maps, you create a new map um, and you can start to just add layers uh, and you just categorize them. What kind of layers do you want? You want to look at all the farms? You want to look at, um, you know, all of the nurseries? You, where, who are all the people selling seeds? in your area, like this became really important, particularly in COVID, right? Um, and then you can take this map, which you made for free on Google, um, and you can either make it public or you can export it to KML, KMZ over here uh, and upload it to Google Earth. Um, so then you have like satellite and some more planning um, tools. Uh, so it's just a really easy way for all of us to be empowered to start to map your own mycelia. So uh, I guess I just want to say that I hope that I have reawakened something that's deep inside all of us. Um, it's time to remember and to heal uh, this gap in our ancestral knowledge. And I hope that I've inoculated you today um, and empowered you to go out and strengthen your own mycelia. We're working to deepen this at Ecological Design, uh, looking to integrate this work with, uh, you know, the Mycelia.Earth platform and other communities. We're honored to work with individuals and communities um, interested in using our maps uh, to change and improve their own watersheds and food sheds and medicine sheds, um, and fiber sheds. And so if you're working on a project that could benefit uh, this from this, you know, we'd love to partner with you. We are taking new clients um, this year, so please feel free to reach out or sign up for our newsletter at ecologicaldesign.land. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard anyone quite so passionately present about maps, but that's um, I love maps. <laughs> the, the context and the, um, the insight strategically that can be gained from them. I hope people 
um, you know, gleaned from your from your presentation. It's it's actually when we start to think about um, you know, where we go next and systemically how we're <clears throat> going to bring it about, we have to you know see ourselves in our local ecosystems and in relationship to everyone else. And I think this is just a really nice, simple, um, but hopefully mind opening um, framing. I just Maybe at, right at the end, you you talked about uh, perma, permacore uh, or whatever it was, <laughs> permaculture core. Um, you know, I mean, there's a bunch of talk in Congress right now about about you know civilian conservation core and stuff like that. Um, I, there's, I'm not sure who's listening and who will listen to this presentation, but there's a there's a lot there with what you presented in what could be shovel ready projects in the sh in short order. Um, I think that really it's you know it's about. <clears throat> all of our relationship with land and and a lot of a lot of people in today's day and age don't have that um, in this incarnation very strongly. So um, anyway, much more there to uh, <laughs> to d digest. Um, I'll just I'll throw a few questions here at you and um, you know, attendees, of course, you know, feel free to post in the Q and A box, and we'll try to engage a um, an active active conversation here. Um, uh, so Abrin, I think, follows up. You know, you brought us all the way to the. Okay, now I know where we're doing things. And then, what did you? What did you do? Um, you didn't have time for that in this one hour to talk about all the amazing things you do. So that's. <laughs> I, it might have been nice to have a, a couple minutes on that. But uh, Bryn says the zoom in on the Polk County map was cool. What did you end up doing after creating the map in terms of projects? Do you want to just give us a couple minutes on the kind of things that you do once you've identified the priority areas? Yeah, I mean, um, right now, so so as I said, we have uh, existing uh, people that we work with in this county. So, uh, you know, we were biased in choosing that one. Um, of course, you're going to be biased in choosing the one that uh, that you want to work in more and and improve more, and that has a closer radius where we're already traveling and being. So, um, it strengthens our our network partners. Um, you know, one of the, I, I briefly mentioned it, but there, there is a farmer led watershed uh, group in, in the Horseshoe Creek um, watershed right there too. And this is kind of an emerging thing that I want to see more of in the Midwest, but these are, these are conventional farmers. Um, a lot of them are no till farmers that have said like, we care about water and we're going to meet regularly and we're going to try out this, you know, cover crop deal and we're going to talk about buffers and um, it's really cool. Um, and it's maybe a different kind of person than uh, we, we might be, um, but we all, we, we're all like aligning on, on the fact that we have water. So I would like to use this um, to further strengthen kind of those water, uh, farmer watershed led coalitions. Um, the farmers union in this, uh, county is very strong. Um, and we also have a very strong grazing community uh, in this county. And um, there's one other, uh, well, there's two other threats right now to the county's environment. Um, one is a proposed hog capo um, with like 26,000 hogs um, from Iowa because they used up all of Iowa's land and they've come up to Wisconsin. Um, and then there's another, there's a frac sand mine as well. So um, this map is also being used to empower those organizer committees. I think the person was asking about you as a, as a um, you know, land designer and implementer, other things that you put in. That was what I took from that. Yeah, so um, one example, so it all empowers you to say, okay, this just, all it gives you a priority and then uh, once you, so then you can hone in on what that priority is. So for example, an inlet coming in uh, from the degraded water creek, we could use mycelial bags um, to help absorb um, and change that water as a, as a myco filter before that uh, creek goes into the larger lake. So that's yeah. one example using just like jute bags with, um, remu uh, with, with wood chips. Um, and sawdust uh, and, and using, um, you know, oyster mushrooms uh, for remediation in the water. That's, that's one example of, you know, there's, there's a lot, um, there's a lot there, particularly we like to help people get cost share money to do these things. So 
uh, going under the banner of you know riparian buffer um, gets us into some of the weirder things that maybe NRCS hasn't heard about uh, that we know can improve uh, quickly. Maybe it's just an entirely another presentation. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, because there's a lot of these things that you're like, oh yeah, obviously we do this, but maybe people would like to hear those specifics um, is my guess. Um, uh, Martha asks, how did you generate the Wapagasset watershed mycelia figure movement flash mapping? The flash map. Uh, so, so these, all of these maps, um, well, the one, the two of them. So we use one program called QGIS, QGIS, and it's open source and free. Um, and one of QGIS's, uh, you know, recent upgrades now has this um, video programming feature to it. So you can check out QGIS. Um, it's really great. Props to Andrew French, a really great map maker that's on our design team. Cool. Um, uh, do you find native people's stone mounds or other sacred sites? Yes. In your work. <laughs> yes, all over the place. <clears throat> um, anything particular you do when you find something like that or? Um, so just so first is just making sure um, that the landowner knows that um, what that is. Uh, and then, um, you know, talking with them about who about what you want to do um, about that. So, uh, you know, I think it's important that we don't cultivate any of those areas, uh, which a lot of them have been cultivated. Um, and or, you know, sprayed and or whatever, just not known. Um, so I think being able to empower people about like, what is this and how can we uh, protect this and appreciate this and or share this uh, so that people know that there, there might be a site here. Yeah. All right. Um, Greg asks, what are some of the companies involved with land trusts? How can we use these programs in my area? He's in Southern California. And thanks so much for the presentation. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think the land trust's work is really important. Um, I'm most familiar right now with, with Agrarian Trust. Yeah. Um, and so Agrarian Trust has uh, a number of, I don't know if it's up to 12 or 13 um, different state chapters because they have to go by state, you know, because all these laws are different in different states. Um, and so we have one uh, Southern Minnesota Agrarian Commons. Um, so I would say, you know, check that out and see if there's one near you. And if there's not, uh, are you able to start one? But essentially it just starts with one land acquisition or donation. Um, and then you can move through. But the way Agrarian Commons is working is that there's a local 50C2 uh, um, and, and then there's kind of like the mother Agrarian Trust that's the 501C3 nonprofit. Um, and so they work together with that. The C2 is the land holding entity, that's the state. Um, and the C3 is the national org, which then pro can provide um, legal support um, and educational resources to build up land for new agrarians to share, which I think is amazing. And I get really excited about that because, you know, thinking about all the perennial food opportunities to put on these lands where people get 99 year leases. Um, and I think you skip, might have skipped over that part about what the agrarian trust is actually doing, which is facilitating land access with a national strategy, yes. you know, um, from people who are, you know, passing it on or would otherwise donate it to something else to facilitate new young land owners of all types to have access. Um, exactly. if, I mean, Thank that's you. something you've been involved in for quite some time and you told me about it. I was like, oh my God, why I never heard about the Agrarian Trust. So um, yeah, there's some, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Super exciting. Yeah, worth looking up. Um, okay, Greg asks, um, I think you might've touched on this, but it's worth repeating. After mapping, how can I further connect and communicate with the farmers and land managers in a certain area? Yeah, so um, depending upon where you are, so this is this is definitely what plays in that that social factor, being able to find 
either uh, non nonprofits sometimes or grassroots organizations or farmer organizations, I think is really key. So in, in my area and what I would like to see more in the Midwest because uh, you know, soil, water, farmers, we really start to get this trifecta of amazing energy um, and, and the people that are in those three sectors uh, you know, are really working on what we need for the future. So that's what I would start looking under is like, who is working with soil? Who is working with water? Those are oftentimes government organizations, watershed districts. I mentioned uh, the NRCS um, soil and water conservation districts. Um, so those, those people are, they have maybe some larger budgets and they can do some of these larger mapping projects, which we use a lot of data from. Um, and so I just ask, you know, we just ask, can we use your data set? Um, and it's very rare that we get a no. Um, it's just people don't know to ask um, because they can't put it public. It's too much memory and whatnot, but you know, look up uh, your county GIS person. Um, you know, that, that really helps to start get some of those land layers. And then the social layers, I think it's really important that we get cost share funding. And so start to make a good relationship with your NRCS officer and see what's possible. It might not fit in their cookie cutter program that they have on their brochure on the table, but there might be some wiggle room there to, to get it to apply for what, for what you want to do. That's been my experience around here is if you actually do reach out to some of those officers, they're very receptive and they do have little pots of money to do interesting things. So, but then I think his question was specifically, how do you reach out to the farmers? And you were starting to say the farmers organizations or, or nonprofits or whatever. Yeah. So, so sometimes there'll be, you know, an actual farming nonprofit that uh, offers education workshops, um, skilling up uh, for farmers. We have a number of those here. Uh, we have a, a good amount of local food hub workers in this, in, in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, the farmers union varies from state to state, really different um, priorities that they work on. But we have um, an entire population of regenerative farmers who have taken all the seats in the, the Wisconsin uh, Farmers Union. So, uh, you know, we have a, a, a unique situation, but- you Just did a say, coup, I think is what you just said. <laughs> it's that, you know, get on a seat, like make a change, you know, um, it really yeah. matters. It really makes a difference of then where money can flow to. Um, go to your farmer's markets, introduce yourself, um, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Like I have no shame. I've, uh, you know, you gotta be careful around here just driving down people's uh, driveways in Wisconsin. But, um, you know, I stop and talk to people a lot that I don't know actually. Yeah, just, <laughs> just engage. Yeah. Um, Lenore asks, uh, <clears throat> who else do you know that is doing this kind of mapping work that organizers and legislators can collaborate with to inform policy on land use clim and climate strategies. My group works in Massachusetts to support regenerative farming, forests, and food systems. Hmm. I don't know. Let's work together to find that out. Um, <laughs> let's let's build know, a mycelia map of all the people. <laughs> there is a yes. So the mycelia, the Earth Network that we talked about here, that the BFA, you know, really helped deepen. Um, there's a lot of collaborators there, and it is you know, moving on a national level, but uh, we need more mapping partners. There's, there's a lot of maps out there. They're just not looking at the right patterns or necessarily are pulling the right layers. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a ton of good, way more technical and higher end than what we're producing over here, right? Um, but they're missing the mark on like the, the criteria. Yeah. Um, I'd say it's a you know it's one of those things that hasn't really coalesced yet, but it seems to have a lot of opportunity. Um, and maybe this presentation can help stimulate <laughs> more energy around that. Um, Great. Let me see. Um, uh, Severio asks a question: um, How bad is the water where the Mississippi enters the Gulf of Mexico? Oh gosh! Um, <laughs> don't you don't want to put your body in it? Um, we have a number of, of water projectors up here and people that have done um, water walks all the way down the Mississippi, people who have done kayaks and river canoes 
Um, you know, there's a lot of dams, but but it can be done. Um, and I've seen a lot of pictures, uh, you know, to have so much, to have like no oxygen um, or, or very little in water to see water, to see, um, you know, red tide, to see uh, just mass, mass fish kills uh, regularly expected seasonally. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's really heartbreaking. Um, but it's not just, it's not just heartbreaking. It's more like, what are we going to drink? You know, um, and what's, what are future people going to drink? Um, but along with just the agricultural runoff, that's a huge amount and sediments that are coming, you know, in our straight ditches where we can, the water moves really fast and, you know, water, water doesn't move straight, you know, it's curvilinear. And so, uh, when we get these straight things, that we make the water do it, the water can't move in its natural way. And so therefore it's very difficult for the water to clean itself. Um, so if you have access to a ditch that you know is moving to a major waterway, you know, talk with the people that mow that ditch and talk about letting it meander a bit. Um, you know, that's a really big important technique here in the Midwest is letting our uh, ditches and creeks uh, meander so that that water can flow in a way that it can heal itself. Yeah, the water's, the water's real bad down there. It's called the dead zone for a reason, right? Because <laughs> everything's dead. Oh. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so Sam has a couple of questions here. Sorry, did you say that the uh, question mark, did you say used oyster, you used oyster mushrooms in the water for the lead? If so, would it work with an African group with huge mercury poisoning um, from mining? Hmm. Uh, yeah, so uh, it, we weren't I looking it was for lead. Talking about. It, was, it was fertilizer runoff, but yeah. It was, uh, but we've had um, a number of remediation projects in the Twin Cities uh, addressing lead, arsenic, cadmium, some of the top heavy metals that we find more in urban farming sites. Um, sunflowers is a really great remediator. Flax is another one. Um, and, and absolutely mushrooms. And just, we just have to remember, um, oyster mushrooms are great here where it's more cold climate. We use more of the blue oyster. So if you're from a warmer temperature, uh, you might look into a warmer temperature oyster mushroom, but I see that as, you know, a really easy and quick way, uh, to get an uptake from a toxicity toxic, um, in the environment. You just have to remember like then that is itself toxic. So then you have to remove the mushrooms, the sunflowers, um, or or the flax uh, to a facility that can handle it. But it absolutely does uh, take metals up. Mushrooms can break down oil spills. Um, mushrooms can eat cigarette butts. Um, you know the 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 end of. I mean, there's there's not a it's the limit of your creativity of, of what you could use micro remediation. Yeah. Um, okay, a couple interesting ones here. Uh, Bill and Jay asks, and you'll appreciate this. Are you finding more farmers adopting Mark Shepard's uh, hazel chestnut and agroforestry practices? He's in Southwest Wisconsin. Do you want to? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, <laughs> are, yes. they, are, they Mark, are they Mark Shepard's practices or do you want to just talk about the, the story there or the history? I think they're, um, you know, uh, ancient indigenous practices. Um, <laughs> and I think that Mark Shepard has done an amazing job of being a herald uh, to yeah. the region ag community about this. Um, his book, uh, Restoration Agriculture, you know, has brought a lot of a, a lot of students that have found me even, you know, have said like, oh, I read Mark's book and um, yeah. I want to do this. And so, yeah, chestnuts. I mean, it's just, you know, you can imagine what, what, United States was a hundred years ago, and uh, you know how many you're on chestnuts the, were on the world land. of the Savannah Institute. You said, which is doing a lot of that systemically. As yes, well. yes, large scale agroforestry. I think is a good trending upward. Uh, we we know we need these more perennial roots. It's not just for windbreaks and conservation anymore. Um, we really need to bring back the the perennial foods and those bones of our landscape. You know that. Um, we were told to plow fence row to fence row and whatnot in the 70s. And uh, so we lost all those kind of bones, but those bones we could be eating too. They're not just for like wind and shade and stuff. 
um, and, and, and animals can be grazing them. So I think the fact that we get uh, hazelnuts here in the cold climate is, is amazing. Uh, zone five, you know, just a little bit further south here, uh, then you start to get more like pawpaw and chestnut and um, a little bit more exciting fruits. Uh, but I work a lot in zone three and four. And so hazelnuts is a really big one for us. And just looking into the cultural practices with hazelnuts alone, um, it's really neat, but being able to press for oil, uh, you know, all those things, uh, I think it's really great. We're, the markets, you know, um, are, are still, the markets exist, it's really, like most perennial foods, the processing um, is still a bit of a hurdle. So, you know, we're still working on that scaling up uh, processing. Cool. Um, Linda asked, can you repeat your water prayer? And Bill and Jay answered, but I'm not sure if you want to just repeat it out loud or not. Yeah, I was even going to say it. Um, I had pulled down one thing I wanted to say about that water prayer was uh, that you can Google Nibi, uh, Nibi song, Nibi, N-I-B-I, uh, which I highly encourage you to do because you get to hear Doreen sing it. Um, and she has really an angelic voice. Um, so I don't, I don't speak, uh, <laughs> way, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say it for you. Nibe giza igu gimi gwich wane megu giza we ne megu, and so that's that's the song. It's it's really gorgeous. Um, but why do we love you? Why do we thank you? Why do we respect you? Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Lewis asks, can you add your websites and the ones you brought up, including where I can find Matthew French's work? Uh, thank you for your inspiring and electrifying works, as thank in you. easy water and grounding. <laughs> thank you. My website? I think your website and the ones you brought up, especially where I can find oh, yeah. French's work. Oh, yeah. You can find it at my website. I don't know if I can do anything. Can I type in the, oh, I can type in the chat. I think if you just say it out loud, it'd be fine. Again, I just wanted oh. to get down. You can, you can always find, you can find us at ecologicaldesign.land. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I put it in, and then if you want to listen to Doreen Day's amazing voice, um, her sister, they're, they're all singers. Uh, she she sings and blesses the Mississippi River every day. Um, okay, the Nibby song, check her out. Doreen Day, I put it in the chat too. Oh, maybe it's only going to panelists. Here we go. I think we'll get it over there. Beautiful. Great. All right, uh, another question. Um, do you use biochar for remediation? And if so, how? Um, we have a few clients that use biochar. We've used biochar over the years. Um, I'm pro biochar. Uh, I think you know it's a it's a great ancient terra preta uh, practice, right? Um, and I think that uh, it's probably most optimized if if your cows ate it and pooped it out um, first. Or chickens. Uh, you know, that, that'd be the highest maybe use of it. Um, but we do see a lot of uh, plant folks um, using it too with, with, great, uh, with great improvement. Um, I like it because, you know, small scale for, for smaller scale people, uh, you can definitely just make it. Um, I've seen some really crazy expensive biochar out there, which makes me question. Um, and I've seen some, some bad biochar simply for sale. Um, so just like learn your product, know your product, buy a little bit of it and see how it goes before you invest. <laughs> yeah. Piece of the puzzle. <clears throat> cool. Um, all right. Uh, another question here. Um, is it, it's possible to, to mapping the mycelia using hyper, hyperspectral Im imaging? Mm. 
I don't know what that means. <laughs> I think it's taking pictures from the, you know, the satellites and things like that, but about sort of a, oh. you know, can you see the imbalances and the, you know, dead zones and the um, weaknesses in the system through that kind of assessment? One would presume it could, it could be done. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and so drones are, I think, a really great tool um, that we can use. You can, we, we've gotten, you know, ortho imagery uh, or where you can stitch together a mosaic of photos too from drones. It's great. I, I think having a flyover of your area gives a lot of insights. Um, some people don't love it or see it as an invasion of privacy. Um, but I think they're great. Um, and so the technology is increasing. I think the average Joe isn't going to buy the software uh, to, to, to do that, to make ortho imagery from drones. It's more fun to just like fly it and see what you see. Um, but we, you know, in the observation kit, in the observation, you know, that we offer, that we, you know, encourage people that we work with to use, um, drones is one of them because especially if you have elders or you have you just have a large land and you don't get out there a lot, uh, doing that flyover uh, once a year or even, you know, beginning of season and end of season, you see the animal trails, you see uh, storm damage, you know, you see a lot more patterns on the land. So I definitely think drones are cool. Um, I think the, the world of mapping is technology is moving really fast. And, uh, you know, ironically, I'm not like a super tech person. Um, but I want to use it enough just as much as it can be useful for me to get our hands dirty, right? Well, it, it facilitates deeper strategic objectives, I think. Yeah, I don't see myself as a particularly tech person either, but I'm certainly working on tech-like projects. And it's not yeah. because of the tech itself, it's just because we see the systemic needs um, planet-wide and we are trying to be strategic about the resources available, I think. So, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we got about just a couple minutes left. Another one from Greg. Um, I'm about to be involved with farm operations and stewarding land on the native reservation with members of the tribe. Any advice for me going in as a guest and of white European descent? Thanks. Uh, cool. Great question. Um, I think it's one is is just uh, just to recognize. Um, you know, the, the, the pattern of um, anything. I mean, you could even compare it to, uh, um, I was, uh, any sort of volunteerism or any sort of project. Sometimes we see that in, um, in core programs or whatnot. Sometimes we see it with, with missionaries or whatever, but whenever someone from an outside comes to a, you know, an internal community, um, and they may or may not be bringing resources or um, additional support. You know, it's just really clear to define what your relationship is uh, for why you're being there and to be just transparent about it. Um, and so you ask a lot of questions and you listen a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, you, Never, you know, don't stand in front of an elder ever. You know, these are these are just general ways that we we are being that we're getting used to. But I think it's really important to be able to uh, let have everyone understand who you are and why are you there and what are you working on. But then also, as we see, you know, other um, permaculture groups, for example, that uh, have done work um, on reservations. Uh, you know, it's really important that we're leading and letting. Uh, the projects be indigenous led. And so however you are supporting that work that, that, that is happening there, and there there's needs to be a lot of work. There's a lot of work in a lot of ways that we can support uh, indigenous people right now, but it needs to be indigenous led. Uh, so that means by paradigm, by actual person, um, you know, and being able to be part of a council or being part of uh, a group that kind of helps uh, even out the energy. So just walk with respect, listen a lot. Yeah, pretend they're your grandparents and you're being respectful or something. <laughs> and you're gonna defer to them. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. Well, um, we're just about here out of time. Um, thank you for, for sharing your passion and your 
insights. Um, I, I hope people grokked the implications of what you're presenting. I think sometimes when it's so far out of out of the sort of the normal day to day thoughts, it takes a little while to settle in. But um, yeah, thank you. Any any uh, final final things you'd like to leave us with? Mm. Uh... No, I just, I just, I want us all to just go out and activate, you know, it's not about the maps, it's about activating on the land. So yeah, I look forward to seeing everybody in uh, activating this year. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, are getting lots of, lots of uh, affirmations here in the chat, but um, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, BFA. Thank you, Dan. Be well. <laughs>